to thank you for the opportunity to join you in this modified garden show. Happy to be here and happy to be able to use technology to um, highlight some of the topics that we need to know more about. I do wonder if this won't be the normal of our future, that this is all we will be doing uh, from now on is looking at each other kind of up close. You know, we don't normally see people this close, nor do we stare at their faces for quite this uh, long a period of time. So if me staring at the camera is making you uncomfortable, one of the two of us can back up. And it will probably be easier if, if you do it than I do it. So that's, um, that's how we'll do that. But uh, today we do want to um, uh, talk about spiders. And that's not necessarily everybody's favorite garden topic, but it's one that gets a lot of questions. And so we're going to cover the common spiders of the Sioux land and the ones that we would expect to see uh, out in the garden. And we'll talk a little bit about the household spiders as well, because uh, you really can't get away with it, with uh, talking about spiders if you don't go inside. Spiders are arthropods and as such they are, um, the, we're talking about the group that are the insects and their relatives. And you see a good variety of those arthropods here that um, we know and uh, come to love. Arthropods are specific animals that have an exoskeleton. These animals have no bones. There's nothing inside of them uh, that would represent bones like you think of your body or your skeleton. And then what makes them different from other invertebrates like earthworms and starfish and clams and so forth is that these are animals with an exoskeleton that also have jointed legs. So a little reminder of uh, what we're talking about here. We're talking about the most, uh, the dominant group of animals in the world when we talk about arthropods. And we're also talking about animals that are cold blooded. They, um, their body temperature is not constant like yours. It rises and falls with the environment, which is why we don't see them in the winter, but we see them in the summer instead. In the arthropod phylum, there are several classes and the class that you're probably most familiar with are the insects, but there's also the arachnid class. And the arachnid class are arthropods that are spiders, mites, ticks, and scorpions. So this is a particular group of arthropods that are different from, the, uh, from their close relatives. And in general, when we're talking about arachnids, we're talking about animals that have two body regions. As you know, spiders, but also all of their relatives only have, uh, have four pairs of true legs. Those are the jointed legs that we talked about earlier on. Spiders and ticks and scorpions never have antennae, whereas insects have one pair of antennae. And crustaceans, like lobsters and crayfish and sow bugs, have two pairs of antennae. And one of the things that most people are very grateful for is the arachnids never have wings. Flying spiders would just freak out so many people if um, that were to happen out there in the real world. So we've kind of set the stage of who we're talking about, starting with animals, breaking that group down into arthropods, breaking that group down into arachnids and going on from there. Now, the um, spiders, Again, in that arachnid class, they have two body regions. There's no um, middle thorax. Instead, there's a head and thorax combined, and then there's the large abdomen. So in the crab spider at the bottom, you can kind of see that little line that separates the uh, cephalothorax, the combination of head and thorax, and uh, from the abdomen that has the pink stripes on it. Again, spiders and all their relatives have eight legs. And when we look at spiders, we're often interested in looking at their eyes. They may, have any, they may have six eyes or they may have eight eyes. We hope the spiders you run into have eight because the spider with six eyes is a bit of a problem for us. But the arrangement and the size of the eyes is how we make a technical identification of spiders, often down to the level of species. So in the case of spider identification, the eyes have it. 
And we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but if you need to know spider uh, identification from eyes, there are lots of eye charts online where you can look up um, how to identify spiders that way. But we're going to be a little more general than what that requires. When you talk about spiders, you pretty quickly have to jump in and talk about the harvestmen, the opilionones. Um, this is an order in the arachnid class that is not spider. So harvestmen are not spiders. They kind of look like spiders until you do a close-up of their body and realize it appears there's only one segment. And that's the abdomen and the cephalothorax appear to be fused together. So it looks like one body segment. Harvestmen always have those eight really long thread-like legs. The nickname Daddy Long Legs or Granddaddy Long Legs is a bit misleading because we have insects with that same common name. So we tend to stick to the name harvestman when we're talking about the, this particular group. There's a myth that circulates on the internet that the harvestmen are, have the most toxic venom and we re should really be afraid of them. And that is pure fake news, it's not true. The, the harvestmen do not have fangs the way the spiders do. And in fact, harvestmen sort of munch on their food rather than impale it and feed on liquids the way spiders do. So just a little sidetrack there from talking about spiders to talk about one of their relatives that uh, is pretty common and pretty well known and to try to dispel some of the myths that occur about it. All spiders are carnivores. All spiders are meat eaters. There are no spiders that are going to feed on your plants. There are no spiders that are going to eat vegetation or ruin your produce. They all feed on uh, little animals that they can catch. Now, when you think of a small spider, the only animals that are likely to be smaller than it is are going to be insects. So occasionally insects, maybe some other mites and so forth, uh, are what the spiders are going to eat. You can see this jumping spider on the right-hand picture has caught and is in the process of eating uh, an earwig. So good for you, spider, eating one of our pest insects out of the garden. Spiders have favorites. They tend not to eat very many ants, but I have seen exceptions to that. Every once in a while in a house, you'll find a little pile of ant carcasses that have been sucked dry by spiders feeding on them. But wasps and hornets, true bugs, the large beetles tend to escape being eaten by spiders. And part of that is because of the way spiders eat. When spiders catch their prey, some of them wrap it up in silk, some of them don't, they use their fangs to inject digestive enzymes into the body of their prey, what they have captured. The enzymes dissolve the guts and the innards out of their prey, and then they suck back the liquid. Now, eventually some of the larger spiders will kind of crunch up what's left of the exoskeleton, but the first step in uh, eating by a spider is to inject digestive enzymes into the body of the prey and then to suck back out the dissolved fluids. So they're on a liquid diet and they do that with the, the fangs they have on the front of their mouth. So remembering that all spiders are carnivores is one of the first steps. And also, as you think about spiders feeding on small insects, they are beneficial. So let's just underline that right away. Spiders are beneficial to our gardens. Uh, we could say they're beneficial to our houses, but most people wouldn't be that generous toward them. But beneficial um, is the, the word I would use. We're going to identify spiders based on how they catch their food. And spiders generally have three different food catching techniques. And we identify spiders by groups based on this, and all the spiders within a group use the same technique. There's a group of spiders that use webs in order to snare their food. This is very familiar to you. You've seen those big round webs along the roadsides in the fall of the year when they're covered with dew. 
That's one kind of web. You may have seen the tangled cobwebs in the corner of your, uh, up next to the ceiling, in the corners of your rooms. That's another type of web for catching food. So some spiders use spider webs as a means of gathering food. Other spiders are active hunters. That is, they chase their food. They're running around the garden. They're running around the landscape. They're looking for food. They run it down. They jump on it. They catch it, immobilize it, and then feed on it without uh, the benefit of any web at all. Then there are some lazy spiders that are called passive hunters that just sit and wait. They don't go anywhere, they don't chase food, they wait for food to come to them. And that's another way of getting fed. If, you're a, if you've got a lot of patience, you can wait for the food to come to you. Otherwise, you can go out and chase it down or you can build some sort of a web to try to catch it. Well, the best known of the web building spiders are called the orb spiders. I think that name relates to the large, frequently round abdomen that's on the end of these spiders. The black and yellow garden spider that you see here is probably the most common example. These are the spiders that build what you think of as, quote, the typical garden web. It's got concentric circles and radiating lines, and usually it's suspended between two plants, the grasses in the roadside, maybe the, between the rows of corn, sometimes down in, in the rows of vegetables. They have this web spun across an opening and as prey land on the web, they get stuck. The spider runs from the middle out to wrap them up and take care of them that way. So web spiders, uh, the orb weavers are really the, the most common one of that. There are 180 species of these orb weaver spiders, orb, web, uh, orb spiders in North America. Typically, I'll see six to eight species of orb spiders in a year. So black and yellow garden spider is really the most common, but there's this orange one called the marbled spider. The, the silver one could either be the silver spider or it could be the banded orb weaver. Uh, there's one called the cat face spider that's down there in the bottom. I don't see a face there necessarily, but there are differences in these and you can recognize them by their colors, except there's a huge variation within species. So. But you need a good reference that will help you identify which orb spider it is if you're interested. But by and large, once you've identified it as an orb spider, you recognize it as a big spider, a web spinning spider that's catching a lot of food. We just wish they wouldn't put the spiders between the rows where we walk because wiping spider webs off your face is no one's favorite activity. The other best known web spinning spiders are the ones that are called the cellar spiders and the house spiders. This one is specifically called the long-bodied cellar spider. And this is the one that you see up in the rafters, up in the floor joists, when you're in your basement looking up at the, uh, looking up at the ceiling. They can be on porches and decks and they'll be outside a little bit, but this is usually a household spider that's inside and one that's pretty easy to recognize because of the really long thread-like legs and the elongated body and the fact that they just make a, a little a tangle of web, okay? Make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, uh, cellar spiders are an indoor one that uh, are probably pretty well known. The other well-known web spider are the ones that are called the funnel web spiders. And the common one that we have in Iowa is called the grass spider. It's an elongated spider. It's got a couple of brown lines on it. It has those long spinnerets on the tail end. And when they make a web, it looks fairly flat. It's not up in the air. It's usually horizontal on a flat surface. And then there's a hole that kind of looks like an opening of a funnel. Here's a funnel web spider on a shrub. And you can see they have made the web around the outside, but then there's a, a, a hole right in the middle. And at the base of that funnel sits the spider. And when something lands on the web, the vibration of the web activates the spider that's hiding down at the bottom of the funnel to come out and investigate to see if they have found food or not. 
Funnel web spiders tend to be more common toward the fall of the year, and grass spiders certainly fit that. And sometimes it's just amazing how much spider web they can make and how many will be out there uh, covering shrubs. They also cover the grass. We know the funnel web spiders and the grass spiders make those flat horizontal webs on the grass and, and when they catch the dew, they show up. The thing to remember is that web on the grass is made by a beneficial spider, not a pest. That is not the web of the sod webworm caterpillar and insecticide is not needed. So we need to do our identification and keep all those straight. So funnel web spiders are fun because you can tickle the web and the spider will come out to see what's going on. But it's also sometimes amazing how many webs are uh, on the shrubs and on the surface of the grass. Speaking of spiders in the lawn, there's one other phenomenon that has happened with web spinning spiders that I have only read about, I've seen pictures of, I've just never been lucky enough to see it, to see it myself. And that's usually on a fall morning. This happens to have been in July when uh, former county director Jim Hill took this picture. But the second half of the summer to the end of the summer, you'll wake up on a dewy morning and the lawn will just be covered with spider webs. Now it doesn't have to be the lawn, but that's the way it is in this case. These are the webs of thousands of baby spiders. Baby spiders are called spiderlings. And there was a huge hatch and they have all made webs that covered the, the, the grass for the morning. Most of them are going to starve to death or they'll die of desiccation as soon as the sun, sun, sun comes out. When the wind blows or the sun comes out, it'll dry up these webs and they'll blow away. This is a very short-lived temporary phenomenon and I hope someday you get to see this. Don't be freaked out about it. It's not a problem. It's not a pest. It's just these thousands of spiderlings all making their webs at the same time, usually on a foggy, dewy morning. So it can look quite spectacular, but it's going to be very temporary and won't last very long. Here's one from just um, a couple of years ago from here in Ames. The spiders hatched. The eggs, uh, the, the eggs hatched, the spiderlings started to cover everything with silk, including climbing up over the barbecue grill. This is probably orb weavers, orb spiders that did this, uh, but just a phenomenal hatch that occurred in a short period of time, make their webs, they all die, and then we go on with our life. So another part, uh, another piece of the spider story uh, that some people are lucky enough to find. Those are the web spiders you're likely to run into. It wasn't a very big group, was it? It was the orb spiders and the grass spiders, the ones that are called the funnel spiders. Those are the ones that are likely to make webs in your landscape. Better known maybe are the huge spiders that freak people out called wolf spiders. Wolf spiders are active hunters. That is, they hunt the same way a wolf does. They get their food by chasing it day and night. They can be active both day and night, sometimes a little more active at night, I guess, but the, the wolf spiders are uh, active spiders. They are huge spiders. They're fuzzy. They're mostly brown to grayish brown. And the thing is, they have these stout legs. We're going to look at some big spiders like we already looked at the long-bodied cellar spider that have these real spindly legs. The wolf spiders tend to be fairly stout, all the better for running through the grass, running through the landscape to find what's out there to eat. Wolf spiders have an interesting behavior in that the female carries the egg sac with her. You've seen these egg sacs hanging in your porch or maybe in the rafters um, under your deck or so, uh, floor joists under your deck. Um, you'll see these little silk sacks. One of the uses that spiders make of silk is to wrap their eggs in a sack. And um, in the case of the wolf spider, they carry that with them. When the spiderlings hatch, they will crawl onto mom's back and she will carry them around for a while while they grow and develop until they're able to feed by themselves. So this behavior of wolf spiders is kind of fun to see. Um, I suppose it's a little freaky to some people to see both a spider and the spiderlings on her back, 
uh, but it's an interesting behavior that they use. There's another large spider in Iowa called the fishing spider, and it looks very similar to the wolf spider, same size. We're talking about a body that can be three quarters of an inch in length. In total, the spread of the legs can be two and a half to three inches, almost to cover the palm of your hand. And there's not an easy difference between wolf spiders and fishing spiders other than fishing spiders usually have striped legs. And you can see that uh, here in this particular picture that um, the, there's some orange bands, particularly on those front legs. They're also an active hunter. They also are so active running after their prey that like the wolf spiders, they will wander into your house by accident where they don't find enough to eat, where they find it too dry to survive. They usually don't last long and certainly they will not reproduce uh, inside the house uh, under normal circumstances. So wolf spiders and fishing spiders are the two most common, and they're also our largest spiders in Iowa. So finding those big spiders, not to worry, they're harmless, they're more afraid of you than you are of them, uh, leave them alone so they can go about their business of uh, catching prey and helping us out. Here's another picture of the wolf of the fishing spider, showing you what we mean when we talk about the stripes on the legs. The other active hunting spider that you're likely to see is, is the jumping spider, and there are 300 of these in North America. I think of these as linebackers. They don't spread their legs out like the spiders we've looked at so far. Generally, they hold their legs very close to their body, and when they do that, um, they um, look very stout. They also jump long distances. If you see one hanging on the wall, they may jump three feet off into the air uh, with a drag line following them so that they kind of spin back down. But they're very active hunters. They jump uh, long distances and they're um, uh, easy to identify because of the overall uh, body shape, the compactness of the body, and then those huge eyes that are staring at you. They probably don't see very well with those eyes other than to catch, detect motion, they detect shadows, they can see things moving, but the uh, bold jumper, the one with these green chelicery, is easy to identify because of the spots on the back, but also because of those large eyes that are right on the front of the, um, of the spider body. Really common to, to find jumping spiders, both outdoors and indoors. Indoors, they're an accidental invader, uh, that got lost and came in by mistake. The other active hunting spider that we only see occasionally is called the woodlouse hunter. And if you have any European origins in you, you know that woodlouse is the European term for sow bug. So the, we could call this one the sow bug hunter. It turns out the Europeans already had named this one the woodlouse hunter. Its coloration is very distinctive with that light tan abdomen and that purplish colored cephalothorax, and then it has those huge chelicery out the front. This is a harmless spider that stays down in the mulch, stays in the leaf litter, where it can hunt for sow bugs and uh, feed on the, the crustaceans, the sow bugs that are living in your garden. The third feeding behavior of spiders was passive hunters, that is spiders that just sit and wait. And the most common ones of those are called the crab spiders. And here you see two yellow crab spiders. The picture on the left, the yellow crab spider has caught a, a hoverfly, also called a flower fly, and is busily feeding on it. So this uh, yellow crab spider is sitting on a yellow flower, very well camouflaged, very hard to see. The flower fly came to visit the flower and became the crab spider's lunch. Here's another view of one of those yellow crab spiders uh, on the, um, in the right-hand picture. And they get their name because of the way the legs sort of stick out to the side. They do kind of look like a crab. They scuttle sideways like a crab, um, but they're uh, passive hunters just waiting for food to come to them. There's a wide range of colors, lots of variation in the crab spiders. There are pink ones and white ones and yellow ones, and some of them have the ability to camouflage themselves by 
changing to the color of the flower they are sitting on. But again, there you can see how the legs are out to the side. The legs are kind of held together the way crabs do. And when you see them run, you realize that they have that crab-like uh, motion as well. So crab spiders are ones that you'll see on the flowers uh, uh, during the summer. One of their relatives and another passive hunter is called the yellow sack spider. This is uh, the um, indoor spider that you see up in the corners where the wall meets the ceiling. And sometimes there'll be a little silken cocoon around them. Um, this is uh, an indoor spider that is not a biting pest, but it has that reputation because people find them inside and because it kind of looks like a spider of the Pacific Northwest that does occasionally bite people, this one is uh, gets blamed for spider bites. To jump ahead of myself just a little bit, this statement, we cannot diagnose an insect or spider from the bite. There's nothing specific about your skin reaction that's going to tell us it's a spider bite. Spider bite is one of the most misused diagnoses. Spider bite is a euphemism for, I've got a skin reaction I can't explain. And we'll talk about that again in a little bit, but the yellow sack spider is common indoors. They're also outdoors. There's a good website called the Spider Hugger. And I love this little phrase that the Spider Hugger uses, I'm in your corner, which of course has the double entendre that yeah, I'm, I'm rooting for you, I'm uh, in favor of you, I'm trying to help you, but also these are the spiders that hide in the corners. So I love that, um, the double meaning of that particular one. But yellow sack spider is one that you'll see on occasion inside. That gets us to the last two spiders we're going to talk about. And in this group of passive hunting spiders are the brown recluse. The word recluse tells you the first thing you should know about them. They don't come out and run around. They don't chase their prey. They don't make webs. They're passive hunters that sit and wait for food to come to them. And they are reclusive. They're not going to be out mingling with people. They're not coming out to see you. They're not coming out to feed on you. But brown recluse is, a, uh, is in this group of passing, passive hunting spiders. Three eighths of an inch body, which is very small. And when people see that brown wolf spider with an inch long body, that's way too big to be a brown recluse spider. Also, notice how spindly the legs are on the brown recluse spider. And I pointed out when we were talking about the wolf spider that they had stout legs, often with spines and hairs on them. So the brown recluse is a, a kind of a fragile, uh, wimpy looking spider because of its small size and because of its long uh, slender legs. The violin or guitar shaped marking on the cephalothorax, the neck of the violin points toward the abdomen. Now there are some other spiders that have brown marks on their cephalothorax and there's a few that might even look like a violin or a guitar, but it points the wrong direction. So there's a whole bunch of characteristics here we need to make sure we see if we're making a diagnosis of brown recluse spider. And you can go years and years and never make the diagnosis of brown recluse spider. I do. I go for years here in the diagnostic clinic and never see brown recluse spiders. They are shy, they are reclusive, they have the long spindly legs. And finally, if you really need proof, you look at the front of the head and where all of the other spiders we have talked about had eight eyes, this brown recluse spider only has six. Brown recluse, spi brown recluse spider is a six-eyed spider, whereas all the other common spiders we've talked about have eight eyes. Now, the brown recluse lives outdoors in the south. They do not survive outdoors in Sioux land. In Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, any place north of here, the brown recluse spider is not an outdoor spider. They could be found indoors because they were brought here by accident. Brown recluse spider is not a native spider. They don't live in this area on a permanent basis, but we do find them occasionally this far north. 
But if you're finding a brown spider outside, it's probably a wolf spider, a fishing spider, one of the others we talked about, including the grass spider. They um, are adapted for not needing much to eat, which is great if you're a passive hunter. Remember, they're just going to sit and wait for food to come to them. Therefore, they're not going to be, um, uh, they have to be, a, they have to have this adaptation of being able to live long times without food. Here's the expected distribution of the brown recluse spider. You can see it catches southern Iowa, it catches the tip of Nebraska. Here in the upper parts of the Midwest, we do not expect to find them other than by accident. Now we have kept records here at Iowa State University since 1968, and we have had specimens of brown recluse come in from the 30 counties that are marked in blue. That doesn't mean those counties are infested. That just means it was a report that someone found one. So brown recluse can be transported in. You can find them in boxes and in ship products and um, items that have come out of an infested area, but they're not likely to survive here for long. But they, if they get established in the house or in a, an apartment or something, we can continue to find them over a period of time. It's just, it's going to be isolated to that one place. Now in Nebraska and South Dakota, they're not supposed to be there, but both of your universities report that they have found specimens. They're just not widely distributed. And the thing is, the brown recluse spider is a passive hunter. They sit, they hunker down, they just sit there. The only way they're going to get around is if someone takes them somewhere. So introductions into new areas is our fault, not theirs. Brown recluse spider bite is highly overrated. Even if they do bite you, there's not likely to be any long-term complications. And as we already said, bites by spiders and insects cannot be diagnosed from your skin reaction. But people who call me say, but look, I've got a spot on my skin that looks just like the picture on the internet. The picture on the internet is probably wrong, especially those that have the gory pictures of my foot is rotting off because a brown recluse spider bit me. Those are not confirmed brown spider bites. That's what someone believes happened to them. And we have to be careful to make sure we don't pass on what people believe in, uh, rather than what we know that to be true from science. So brown recluse spider bite is highly, over, um, uh, highly overrated. There are some places that report brown recluse spider bites like California. They don't even have brown recluse spiders. So doctors will say this to get you out of the office and know that it's likely to clear up on its own. Uh, the bite is usually painless. We don't feel them bite us. There could be an enlarged um, reddened area. And if you need to know more about how this all fits together, um, Jody Green from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln has this great article called Brown Recluse Spiders Misidentified, Misdiagnosed, and Misunderstood mostly misdiagnosed. Large brown spiders are not brown recluse spiders, although that seems to be the assumption of a great many of people. There was a great study done uh, many a few years back where they looked for in, uh, evidence of brown recluse spider bites, and what they found was 60% of the reports of brown recluse spider bites came out of areas where the spider did not occur. So this is what people say when they don't know what else to call their skin problem. Uh, it must be a spider bite. And if it turns nasty, it must have been a brown recluse spider bite with no evidence other than just a guess to make that. Um, the other thing they found in that particular study was that 90% of confirmed brown recluse spider bites will heal without problems. Now, how do you confirm that it was a brown recluse spider bite? mostly because you watched it happen. If you saw the brown recluse spider and you saw it on your skin and where the reaction took place, that's how we confirm it. Finding the brown recluse spider in your house a few days later is not a confirmed uh, infestation. The problem is systemic reactions may occur, the venom may cause blood clotting, and it may cause necrosis of the tissue. Ulcers may develop, bacterial infections set in, and then you get the really gory pictures on the internet, which may or may not be brown recluse spider because everything from MRSA to other skin ulcers 
can present that exact same appearance. So early on, there may not be much to look at in terms of the, the brown recluse spider bite, but if you're looking at gory pictures on the internet that say, look what the brown recluse spider did to me, it's probably a misdiagnosis, it's somebody's guess, and it's probably one of these other ulcerative skin conditions. Can't get away from talking about spiders without talking about the black widow spider, the other potentially damaging spider that we have uh, in parts of the country. Usually not so much here in the uh, upper Midwest, although uh, we do get reports of black widow spiders as well. There are five different species. There's a northern species, there's a southern species, there's a western species. It really isn't um, much of a problem to identify them. The natural distribution is all south of us, but they can be dispersed here in boxes, pallets, and so forth. And that's why we do worry about the, the black widow spider, because they'll be here occasionally. Half inch long, round, shiny, almost marble-like abdomen. And then on the underside, there are these two red triangles that touch in the middle forming an hourglass. There are lots of spiders that have red marks, but this red hourglass on the underside of the abdomen is very distinctive and uh, how we would identify black widow spiders. They live in protected locations. They do make a tangled bit of web, but again, they're primarily passive hunters. They don't come out and search for food uh, by crawling across your pillow at night. They're going to stay behind the water heater and the crawl space in the attic or in the garages where they can uh, just wait for food to come to them. So black widow spider is another one that we might see. When a black widow spider does bite, they say there is an initial, an initial pain. You feel it and you know it right away that something happened and that's why black widow spiders are a little easier to diagnose because you look down and you see what's going on. Systemic reactions, everything from nausea to difficult breathing to sweating to rash and itching can happen uh, later. And if you have any of those conditions, we hope you'll uh, get to a, a doctor immediately. This study from 2011 was published uh, from the National Poison Data System. They looked at 23,000 exposures to black widow spider where people were, were bitten. 65% of the people who were bitten by a black widow spider had little to no reaction. A one third of the people had a moderate effect that required some kind of treatment. And only 1% of the people who were bitten by the black widow had any kind of a life-threatening effect. Your threat of the coronavirus is much greater than the threat of a black widow spider and certainly much greater than the threat of a brown recluse spider. So we fear these spiders, we respect these spiders, but they really don't deserve the uh, credit they get. So how do you avoid spider bites? You look before you reach, you vacuum out under the water heater before you put your hand in there, remove clutter, check behind the boxes that you've had stored for a long time. Aerosol sprays directly at the spider will work. And again, if there's any question about a reaction or a spider bite, see your medical provider. Indoors, spider control is best done with the vacuum cleaner and the broom. As frequently, regularly, as thoroughly as you can, vacuum the cracks and crevices to take down the webs, the spiders, and their egg sacs. In my deck, I have to do that a couple, three times a summer. It's just on my schedule. When I see webs again starting to appear, I get out the shop vac and suck all those down and sweep all that up. Outdoor spiders will come in if they find an opening. So just like we say for box elder bugs and lady beetles, seal the cracks and gaps. And sprays are of little to no benefit when you're trying to control spiders either outdoors or indoors. The spray pretty much has to hit the spider directly. And if you're going to hit it directly, you might as well vacuum it up or sweep it up and discard. That's what I wanted to cover in terms of spiders that you're likely to run into. We've got the rest of our time together to answer your questions. So I will stop share and turn it back to um, our hosts so we can see what questions have come in. Feel free to go ahead and, oh, sorry, Carol. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say, feel free to go ahead and put your questions over in the chat box. Uh, Carol or myself will go ahead and read them to Donald. Um, just so then it's on the recording here.
while we're waiting, I'll go back to um, my last slide in case someone's interested in my email address, drlewis at iastate.edu. Mostly I'm working from home, so the office phone number won't get you uh, to me in a hurry, but eventually I get the messages if you've left one on my office phone number of 515-294-1102. Email works much better in these days of social distancing and working from home. So feel free to uh, uh, contact me if you have any questions. And just while we wait uh, to see if anybody else has questions, um, I did also post the evaluation to Donald's presentation in there. So please feel free to go ahead and copy and paste the link over um, into your internet browser. If you have any trouble with it, you can go ahead and just write in the chat that you're having trouble or you can email me and I can email it back to you. I'll put my email in the chat box. But we do have one question. Are there any indoor spiders which will not survive outdoors? You know, the long-bodied cellar spider lives un in the joists under my deck during the summer, but I always assume they move there from indoors. I don't know that they can survive the winter outside. They just seem a little wimpy and they seem a little indoors, but by and large, um, with if the weather is cooperative, spiders can live in both places. More often, it's the outdoor spiders that wander in but um, the American house spider got its name because we find it in the house, but I don't know that that's exclusive to meaning it can't live outdoors. I think there's a preference um, that, that has adapted for certain spiders that have adapted to live in a certain place. So I should have just summed that up and said, I'm not sure, but by and large, uh, we find them in one place or the other most of the time. And we had a, another one here, which was, what is the typical lifespan of the common indoor spiders? Well, that's a great question. I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> I think two to three years is what we expect spiders to live, especially the larger ones um, that we find. There's a pretty fast turnover with spiders, but it's not nearly as fast as some of the insects like aphids and mosquitoes that have a generation every couple weeks. I think spiders uh, live much longer and they're much slower to reproduce. So I would say you could keep a spider alive for a couple, three years. Now, if you keep it in captivity in a jar and you keep throwing food to it, they can live for a decade. We have some people who keep spiders in jars on their desk. I did that for a while and decided I didn't need to do that anymore. Um, but in captivity like that, they can live for years. I think in the, in the natural environment of your house, it's more likely to just be a couple years. Do hummingbirds or moths ever get caught in a big garden web? You know, I think hummingbirds are pretty tough. And even though those big orb weaver webs are sticky, okay, the, the, the um, round, the concentric circles are sticky, the radiating lines are not, the spider knows to walk on the radiating lines. That's why they don't get stuck in their own web. Um, but the, the hummingbird, I think, could fight its way out. A moth certainly can get caught, and moths do get caught in those big spider webs. Um, the spider runs over, wraps them up, and you'll see a, a little case in the, of spider silk that's three quarters to an inch in length. They have caught something fairly large that landed on their web, and they were able to wrap it up, impale it to paralyze it, wrap it up and save it to eat later. Should I leave the spiders alone in my garage since they are likely taking care of small insects? Sure, you know, I, that's easy for me to say. I'm an entomologist, I kind of like spiders. I watch them, I study them, I pay attention to them. I've been at this job for 42 years and I have always told people to, to like house centipedes, those inch long things that have 30 long thread like legs that scurry across your counter when you least expect it. They are also beneficial because they're feeding on insects and uh, small arthropods. So because they're beneficial, sure, we should tolerate them if we can. I've never convinced anyone in 42 years that they should enjoy house centipedes 
and I don't expect to, to in, um, encounter very many people that will appreciate spiders, but aside from the untidiness of the webs, if you can tolerate them, sure. Now, untidiness is in the eye of the beholder, and the reason I get out my shop back is because the partner I live with complains about the spider webs and says it's time to do some cleaning. So if you could tolerate them, that would be my preference, but if you can't, we have a simple control for them. Donald, I have a question. This is Carol, and I'm wondering how many times a spider reproduces in a summer? I don't know, and I suspect there's such huge variation. I don't think that big wolf spider gets to make very many egg sacs in her lifespan. I'd be surprised if she gets to make a couple, three of those um, in the span of her adult life uh, after she's been mated. They, I don't think spider reproduction is an explosion, the way ants can explode, the way aphids and uh, mosquitoes can explode. I think reproduction is much slower. I don't have an exact number for that, and it's probably highly variable, but there's not going to be um, a large number of offspring per female. And of course, I'll look that up and I'll know that answer the next time someone asks me. LEH says, sure, tolerate spiders, take them back outside. You know, the, the um, uh, living a life of HEMSA, doing no damage, um, means we appreciate and respect all living beings and catching spiders and putting them back outside is one of those things that um, fits that life philosophy. The other end of that spectrum is you immediately smash everything you can with a rolled up newspaper. But living a kinder, gentler life is what I have tried to do and relocating spiders and relocating mice that get into the house is how we live. I, do, I know that not everyone can do that, but uh, uh, thank you for the uh, comment that catch them in a cup, move them back outside, move them back down to the basement, take them, put them in someone's garage who will tolerate them, um, is in my opinion, a nice way to live. 